Welcome to the stream. I'm Ahmed Chabuddin. People in Tunisia are sounding off over an increase in racist violence and hate speech against sub-Saharan migrants and refugees from Africa. The outrage follows xenophobic statements by Tunisian President Qais Saeed and other officials using anti-black racist rhetoric. Today we ask what's driving racism and violence against black people in Tunisia and what can be done to address it? And of course, we always want you to join the conversation, so be sure to share your thoughts and questions with us on YouTube. Joining us to discuss from Tunis, journalist Elysia Folkman, with us from Dakar, Khaula Kiksiki. I think I got that last name wrong, but activist and co-founder of Voices of Black Tunisian Women. And last but not least, from Tunis, Amna Galali, Deputy Regional Director for the Middle East and North Africa for Amnesty International. Um, thank you, ladies, for joining us. So much to discuss in today's show. I want to start with the basics. For those who don't know what's happening, uh, Elysia, could you tell us what's driving the crackdown on migrants here? Well, this is actually nothing new. I've been reporting on police uh, arrests and violence towards black people uh, for, for some years now. Uh, what's, what's sort of, I think people became aware when the Forum for Economic and Social Rights published uh, the, the, another 300 people had been arrested, black people had been arrested in February. Now, this happened last year. Mm -hmm. And what the police are saying is that it's because they don't have what's called a class du jour, a residency card. But this is you know, this is something that's actually ridiculously difficult to obtain because the bureaucracy is so heavy and, you know, people wait and wait and pay and pay and never get their cuts to shore. And then they have these sort of seasonal crackdowns that are called a map or a shats, which literally means a hunt when police surround uh, usually like metro stations and they catch black people and shake them down with the cuts to shore. And if they don't have that, then they arrest them. Um, there are also the forced expulsions, you know, for you know, the border police. So this is this is kind of an explosion of something that's been going on for a long time. Right. I think it's fair to say that Tunisia at the moment is a social and economic sort of pressure cooker. So, so so, so, you know, it's been going on for a long time. That context is certainly needed. And I want to ask you, Khaula, I mean, when we talk about the context within which this is happening, we've seen these statements from the president, but there's also a broader economic context, right? People are suffering from social, economic, political turmoil. Um, are black migrants, uh, and maybe even other black people living in Tunisia, being scapegoated here? Yeah, so... I will start by correcting my name. I'm Khawla Ksiksi. Ksiksi, thank you. I <laughs> appreciate that. Yeah. So, in fact, I agree uh, what's happening in Tunisia, it's not new. But uh, I, would, uh, I, I would like to contextualize a little bit. Please. Because uh, Tunis uh, Tunisian and Tunisia has always um, seen racist and xenophobic acts. But this time it was institutionalized. And the president made the statement that accentuate this racism. So, uh, uh, in fact, I think that the response of the president is populist response. It's uh, classic, we know it, and mm -hmm. we have be, we, we, we seen this everywhere in the world. And I think that the economic situation, the fact that Tunisians are really suffering from a huge economic crisis, mm -hmm. and it's increasing every day, it's so classic, it's so standard, we see it everywhere. People always look for something to put, for someone to put the burden on it. The fact that sub-Saharan black persons and migrants and refugees are now in Tunisia and they are visibly different and we have this historically uh, heritage of uh, racism, of segregation, of uh, xenophobia, mm -hmm. we always... Uh, seen acts of racism. So I think that the, the economic situation and the president's statement uh, made it worse for sub-Saharan African migrants and refugees in Tunisia. Right. So um, mm -hmm. I was going to I was going to ask, you know, the perception and a lot of the rhetoric, rhetoric seems to suggest that black migrants are taking over the country, that there won't be a country left for others. Uh, and I just want to clarify in this tweet, you know, Larry Madao uh, saying there are 20,000 sub-Saharan Africans in Tunisia compared to a population of 12 million. 
So they're not taking over. Uh, the president's co comments echo the great replacement theory that's popular in right-wing European and North American circles. He's being accused of racism. So I just want to know, Amna, when, when, when we, we hear that he's being, uh, excuse me, let me just pop through here um, on my screen. I'm trying to get to, um, yeah, there we go. I just want to get to this. Uh, so is, is this Amna to you an example clear cut where the president is inciting violence against black Africans in Tunisia? Um, thank you for the question. I think uh, it is quite clear uh, from the statement of the presidency that the words that he used um, and the words, words he uttered and those that uh, his, uh, you know, like that were published on his uh, official page definitely um, can be interpreted as inciting violence. Because he didn't only, you know, like mention that illegal, you know, like undocumented mm. migrants should be, migration should be controlled. It was broad. It was broad. But he, he, but he said like things which are really very serious and which incite violence against the migrants. He um, accused them of being, uh, of uh, sowing, you know, like violence in Tunisia of um, come become, you know, like uh, inciting also crimes. Um, so he's stigmatizing them. He's stigmatizing mm -hmm. a whole community. And this is what we call racism, you know, like this is like typical racism. Uh, the president and uh, his entourage and like the people who are very close to him, including the minister of uh, foreign affairs, try to uh, whitewash. Uh, the president and try to, uh, you know, like downplay yeah. uh, the racist aspect of uh, his words. But this is what we call racism is accusing a whole population, a whole community of being at the heart of a problem uh, that mm. uh, a country is uh, going through, um, you know, using them as scapegoats, as you rightly, uh, you know, like asked earlier on. I think it's uh, really very clear that uh, yeah. the president uh, and the official you know like discourse of the of the authorities in Tunisia are using the black uh, community and black migrants uh, from sub-saharan africa as scapegoats sure. to uh, blame their own failures to tackle the and, economic uh, and, and of social course, crisis and of course Tunisia. to clarify for our audience it's it's migrants it's refugees and then there's also a broader implication about just black people so in general right and and so elisa go ahead elisa they're actually even calling them all migrants is stereotyping and very racist uh, the, the official figures are just over 21,000 are people of the sub-Saharan diaspora. 8,000, over 8,000 of those are students who are paying for their university education or their professional training in Tunisia. These are people who are paying in you know three to four thousand euros a year in hard currency. Yeah. They have to pay for the carte séjour. They pay 1,000 dinars, but normally it's 150, and the administration won't give it to them. So there's there's a big problem so, generally, not not just from the, the president, but we're we're labeling people yeah. um, with a, a term that's now become very. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so if I may, if I may, I mean, we have a lot of people on YouTube. Before, before you get um, started, I just want to say, Luganda and YouTube saying there's a huge identity crisis with nations of Northern Africa. When I first started living there five years back, I had a big culture shock. And uh, there's a lot of other comments where people are just very disappointed uh, to be seeing the rise in anti-black racism. So I want to ask you. Um, Let's talk a little bit, if we can, Khaula, about the actual conditions for black residents in Tunisia. A researcher with Human Rights Watch who specializes in refugee and migrant uh, research, Lauren, sent us this video. Take a listen to what she had to say. Uh, Human Rights Watch has spoken with over a dozen individuals, um, black sub-Saharan Africans who have been targeted for arbitrary uh, evictions, for violent assaults and other abuses. And 
people are currently homeless in need of immediate assistance and shelter, but also people need effective protection by state authorities to ensure that actually those who have committed these attacks will be investigated, arrested, prosecuted, and that um, sub-Saharan Africans in Tunisia will no longer face arbitrary arrest and detention solely on the basis of skin color. Khawla, there seems to be a kind of a, a dismissal that this is even happening. Like they keep deflecting, the, the president seems to be maybe gaslighting. Um, what do you make of, uh, what can you tell us about what it's like for black residents in Tunisia, particularly these, these migrants and refugees? So I will follow up, in fact, what has been said about migration. I would like to precise that 18,000 Tunisian migrated to Italy on 2023. Mm. So, and that's what explains racism, because normally Tunisians are migrants and they, they go all over the world. But when it comes to black persons coming to Tunisia, it's different mm. and we treat them differently. The president has another treatment for them. We had Syrian, we had Libyan refugees, mm -hmm. but we haven't ever seen this kind of discourse. So, and mm -hmm. in fact, um, I'm not in the best place to talk about what refugees or migrants from sub-Saharan Africa are facing. Sure. Because I think that they are in the best, in a better position to talk about, but I will talk about what the black person in Tunisia is dealing with. And I will, I will share my well, experience. When well, Khawla, I, I was, I was going to say, I mean, you must experience harassment and abuse yeah. if it, uh, on your own, correct? Yeah. As a Tunisian. Of course. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would share something. It's not my story. It's not the story of all the black Tunisian women because it's uh, institutionalized, it's uh, historical, and it's systemic racism. Uh, for myself, when I want to relate to migrants from sub-Saharan Africa, sometimes they think that I'm not Tunisian. And in this uh, like two minutes or two seconds in which people think that I'm not Tunisian, I receive a double aggression. Mm -hmm. When people think that I'm not from Tunisia, they insult, they attack, they sexually harass me. And when I speak in Arabic, sometimes they say sorry, sometimes they not. So it's so clear that there is cross discrimination and I want to look at it from intersectional lenses. Mm -hmm. It's cross discrimination. People are facing xenophobia and racism in the same time. People are, are facing it in institutional because the state made their statement about it and they were so clear about it. They are facing social discrimination mm -hmm. and violence and individual violence. So what I want to highlight here is that we are we are in a case in so complicated case of cross discrimination, especially with women, migrant or right. refugees the, with the complicated situation. They are mm -hmm. facing a lot of aggression and it's so frustrating for them and it's so marginalizing for them. And, and, and that intersectional sort of angle that you just shared with us, I think, is important because um, I want to share with our audience uh, some other things that are happening sort of socially around this online. Black Tunisians, like yourself, are posting photos of themselves online with their Tunisian passports and idea, IDs. And this is because black people are being warned, um, you know, that they should be carrying their IDs in case they get stopped or harassed. So, you know, this is a kind of a beautiful act of solidarity online. Uh, amongst black Tunisians with the migrants and refugees that are kind of getting the brunt of it now um, from the institutions and authorities. And as we see these pictures, I, I just wonder, you know, Amna, I, I, a lot of this racism that we just heard outlined from Kaula, a lot of this is ingrained deeply in Tunisian culture and, dare I say, Arab culture. I mean, this comes from the slave trade. And I just wonder if you could uh, comment on why you think, beyond the economic situations, is this just a taboo topic? Is it something that's become so normalized, the way that uh, people in Tunisia refer to uh, black people? Um, it is a taboo topic in the sense that um, it hasn't been, you know, like analyzed enough uh, through like studies or discourse, like uh, you know, deconstructing this uh, discourse mm. on uh, uh, on Tunisians. Um, whenever you talk to Tunisians, for example, they would say, "No, we are not racist." 
Um, we don't have that in that in our culture, and so it's really a taboo issue. But just what I just also wanted to mention that, mm. uh, despite the fact that it is somehow a taboo issue, and the the the, the fact that there is a lot of racism and it's ingrained in yeah. uh, Tunisia, uh, there were some steps uh, forward, you know, like from a legislative point of view mm. to uh, tackle this racism. So mm. in 2018. Tunisia enacted the was the first country in the Middle East to enact a law to fight uh, racism, and this law basically prohibits, you know, uh, discrimination and prohibits also all forms of uh, racism. Um, well, I'm not. You know, in, forgive, in me, forgive, me, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me for jumping in, but you know, so the laws are on the books, and this is not often. Something that's unusual in other countries as well. The law is there to protect them, but is it is it actually being used, or is it more just? I hate to say it, but for PR purposes. It has not been really used. It's not a PR for a PR purpose because this law is the result of the fight of uh, hundreds of uh, of people, including people in civil society, people who mm -hmm. are, uh, you know, like who fought uh, very hard for uh, for the for this law, and people who are in. Uh, you know, like um, associations or organizations uh, mm. to fight discrimination uh, on racial basis. So uh, it is definitely something that uh, was a success story in the sense that uh, the fact that Tunisia uh, took enacted this law was uh, really very good. But uh, the problem is the implementation on right. uh, the ground and the, 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 um, the fact that uh, the institutions in Tunisia are still not um, prepared to uh, to implement this law. Yes, most most certainly. And um, you know, I I want to hear directly from some of these migrants themselves who are kind of explaining their precarious predicament, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, in this case, a Sudanese and Ivorian uh, migrant. Take a listen. The situation is getting worse and worse. When we walk in the street. People bully and insult us and ask us to go back home. The situation has become unbearable. We appeal to the UNHCR, enough is enough. As the Tunisian people do not want refugees in Tunisia, we ask them to be repatriated even to Niger or Rwanda. Everyone is free to live in an African country. We are all Africans. Why so much racism? You live in your peace in your country, but here we do not live in peace. So really, I ask the president to see all these small problems. We are brothers, Ivory Coast, Mali, all Africans. We are brothers. We must help each other. We must love each other. That's the most important thing. Now, at the same time, Khawla, of course, we've seen a lot of solidarity, protests, people uh, speaking out about this online. Uh, I wonder, do you think this is a flashpoint? Where do you expect this to go as people search for solutions for solving Tunisia's economic and political situation, but specifically this, this issue of anti-black racism? Do you, do you anticipate it getting worse? So to answer to your question and to follow up uh, what Emna said about the law, in fact, uh, me, myself, as a black Tunisian person, relatively privileged, yeah. I, I don't refer to this law. And I, uh, I filled a complaint one time, and it has been now three years that I didn't get the response. I would say that this law is for PR reason, because Tunisia is one of the first countries that abolished slavery, is the first Arab country that, that uh, implement a law against racial discrimination. I would highlight that there is a lot of activists and we did a lot and we advocated a lot for this law, but this law is, I would say that it's ink on paper because uh, this law normally is followed by social, cultural, economic de discrimination policy. And we don't see this discrimination, this de discrimination policy. To fill a complaint, you have to pay a lawyer, you have to pay notaries, you have to pay a lot of persons. And we know that black persons are marginalized on the economic scale. So mm -hmm. they are on the bottom of the economic, uh, of the economic um, scale in Tunisia. So what I suggest as a solution and what 
it's it's kind of what I what I blame this law for is the fact that they want to treat a complicated subject and they want yeah. to treat a complicated issue in the society with the law. Mm -hmm. It's okay. It's good. We are so happy. We we are protecting people with this law. Yes, when they have enough privilege to go and to benefit from this law, mm. but. We didn't see any cultural um, approach of inclusion. Yeah. We, we didn't, uh, in the law, the 11th article, it mentioned that Tunisia commit to put in place national strategy to fight against racial discrimination. And we didn't see this. So the law was implemented at 2018 and to 2023 and nothing on the ground. So, so Khawla, I appreciate you speaking so passionately and personally about your experience with this. And, you know, part of why we're doing this show is we asked our audience, for example, what they think this is about. Why this resurgence, uh, Elysia? And, Kalkasim, uh, right here on Twitter, saying the main cause of racism is rampant injustices of any form and community. Further, the reason for this injustice is politicians are elite of that society, but they're blaming minorities to divert folks' attention from themselves. I think the same is true in case of Tunisia. So it seems like perhaps the president or you know the government is, is losing political support. There was a time not so long ago that a lot of if I speak quite frankly and candidly, a lot of young Arabs looking to Tunisia after the, the Arab revolutions about a decade ago, looking to it as sort of the last hope um, for, for a more progressive or de democrat de democratic society, that tide has shifted. And I wonder, you know, we have a comment from a 20-year-old, a very young, I believe 20 or 21, a young Tunisian woman named Tharwa Boulefi. Um, talking about how shame factors into all of this and how it's a bit embarrassing what's happening. Take a look. So now more than ever, Tunisians are most divided between those who support the uh, president's racist statements and uh, try to justify it objectively and um, others. Um, they are also and unfortunately demonizing each other uh, and um, accusing um, each other of not wanting what's best for um, their country. So uh, there is also a feeling of uh, general shame, uh, especially regarding Tunisia's image in front of the um, world. So uh, I'm wondering, Elysia, first, you know, we talked a lot about how Tunisia has achieved all these firsts, you know, uh, so to speak, and whether it's being done for sort of public relations or managing reputation or not. I'm wondering, it's not a signatory, though, to the Geneva Convention on Refugees. It doesn't really have a formal immigration law like many other Arab countries. So where is the hope for you in terms of changing things on the ground? I think the, the hope comes from civil society and really concerned citizens, just like that young woman. Because as, as horrible as everything the, the president and the authorities are, are doing, what we're also seeing on the ground is, first of all, a very rapid um, assembly of civil society, literally the, the day after um, this, you know, the president, uh, president's statement. And they formed the anti-fascist front. But it, it, it went on and criticised him in March. But it's not just that. Um, these people are organising help and support and aid for those who have been evicted. There's a sort of anarchic um, cooperation that's, that's happening very much underground, very mm -hmm. subtly, that's providing food. Uh, it, I ran, you know, when you, I was first down there, there was just sheets of plastic. People have rallied. They've brought, brought down tents. They're feeding people. There's a, um, you know, in, in this very dark spot, we're also seeing yeah. the absolute best situations. Yeah. Yeah. People who would never want to see another person go hungry, and they are the hope. Well, that, there's a lot of hope that's coming to me from this conversation. Um, certainly not the first or last that we're going to have here. It's a story that we hope to continue to follow along with your guidance, your expertise. I want to thank Elysia, Khawla and Amna for being with us and to you for watching. See you next time.